Well, for more, Mark sat down with the founder and CEO of Rome, Tim Swift. He began by asking about what makes other labs stand out. Other lab looks very different than most models. Uh, from the outside looking in, people think it's an incubator. Uh, I think our biggest difference there is an incubator brings in outside ideas in to help foster companies. And I think we start a little bit differently. Uh, our goal is to make companies, but as opposed to bringing ideas in, we build them all internally. And so it really is, it's kind of more of an idea lab than anything else. Was it hard to find the right mix of, you know, you're worried about like who owns uh, what technology when you, when you reverse the model? Definitely now there's, there's far more of a, a set model. I think the reality is, is when we first started and when I came in, um, we were all a lot of people who just wanted to see technology be useful. Uh, and we, were all, we all had the same aligned objectives and the same interests. And so as we went through the process, we made set decisions. And some we've had to correct through the way. We learned a lot in the process. But there definitely is a scenario where, as a team, we make a decision that, yeah, this is, this is worth going and doing. And the world needs it. So you came to Other Lag. Did Rome exist when you came to Other Lag? No. So when I came in, I, my previous life, I built traditional exoskeletons, um, and I had uh, kind of come to a point in my career where that didn't make sense. Uh, and I joined Other Lab with the goal of saying, how do we make exoskeletons in a different way? Your exoskeleton is essentially made of nylon and air, is that right? Yeah, so we make exoskeletons a different way. Uh, as opposed to the metals and motors that dominate traditional devices, we make devices that are predominantly fabrics and plastics. Uh, and so the, a lot of the fabrics that we use right now are nylon, um, but the goal is to stay away from the things that drive up large costs, large weights of traditional devices. And what are your applications right now? What are you targeting? Um, we've definitely circled a few, but I think we're kind of pre-publicizing uh, what those are. Um, what, what I can definitely say, though, is, is we've, we've got a lot of funding through military applications. We all know that there's clear military spaces. Um, I would have no problem with, with meeting the needs of people that look like that. But our real goal is to get into everyday life. Um, and so our goal is wherever the body becomes the barrier, these are the areas that we're looking like at. And you can see these in, in the real world, right? There are people who want to hike farther. There's people who, uh, as they get older in their lives, they can't stand up the same way. Um, there's, in, in the industrial sector, there's $15 billion a year in the US alone in workman's comp due to overexertion injuries. Using a fabric-based exoskeleton, how much do you believe you can reduce the cost? So I would believe that we're talking about devices that we can commercially sell for a few thousand dollars. Um, and to kind of put context around that, uh, the devices that I spent my life building were tens of thousands of dollars for materials to just build these devices. A lot of the robots that are put out in the field today, you simply feel they're just too heavy. A lot of people, when they think of exoskeletons, they think that it's a battery problem. Um, and it's not a battery problem. The real issue with robots right now isn't batteries, it's robots. So if you look at the exoskeletons on the market, 10 to 20% of their weight is batteries. The rest is structure. So when you're, when you're buying a device that's a 60 pound machine uh, to help you walk one mile an hour, that's not, that's not 40 pounds in batteries. That's 40 pounds in just structure, right? And the problem is, how do you make that lighter and that cheaper? I saw your early prototype, uh, which was helping um, the arms. Yep. Uh, soon you're going to have something out in the market or available that is not is focused on the, the lower bodies. Our goal is to focus on lower extremities. Obviously, we built an arm, uh, arm prototype so we could demonstrate the concepts uh, in the early stages. Uh, but a lot of our work from then has gone into lower extremities. Um, and if you look at the market in exoskeletons, this is definitely what's dominated the exoskeleton spaces. How much were you influenced by Iron Man suit? <laughs> so it's funny. I actually, I actually lead for with a lot of people that uh, that we, I make exoskeletons. No one knows what I'm talking about, and I say, well, think of Iron Man. So you're you're thinking of the wrong thing, but at least you're thinking of a good version of the wrong thing, and then I bring you back. So uh, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of us who sat down and, and thought about that early in in the early stages. Um, the reality after you've lived the exoskeleton life is we are nowhere close to Iron Man. <laughs> um, not even remotely. In tests with your prototype, what have you found so far? This is actually the thing that gets us really excited. So we have early prototypes that are showing a lot of things that we've never seen uh, in the world. Um, probably $300 million, 30 years of development in exoskeletons. And the stated goal has always been run faster and run for less energy. Well, our early prototypes, we can actually, for the first time, make people run faster, run for less energy. Um, we're seeing devices that 
we conceivably believe we can sell at scale for a few thousand dollars. So how many years are you you thinking three, five years we'll, we'll have devices mm -hmm. that'll make us run faster, yeah. able to dunk or things like that? Yeah, so I, I wholeheartedly believe I want you to go to Foot Locker and buy a device for less than a thousand bucks that makes you dunk a basketball. I believe that's an amazing future that all of us can connect with. Uh, that's not coming tomorrow. Our goal is within the next year to two years to have devices on the market that people can start to pilot, start to understand and start to work with. Um, and then from there, obviously, there's a pipeline of things that we're trying to fill as we grow from early capabilities into those dreams.